right. So with that, I think we can get started. So first of all, welcome everybody to Datadog on Serverless. Today we're going to talk a bit about how the security team at Datadog has been using serverless. And I think one of the interesting points here is kind of how serverless fits into a greater organization that might not be all running on serverless. Um, and I'm Kirk Kaiser. I'm the technical evangelist at Datadog, and I'm the evangelism team lead. Uh, I'm joined by Andrew Krug, who's also a technical evangelist and all around security geek here at Datadog. Also on the call, I have David Hui from the security platform, and he's the security platform team lead, and Will Urbanski, who is the active defense team lead. So a bit of context about Datadog and kind of why serverless is relevant to us and why it has been so impactful. Um, serverless itself is a monitoring and analytics platform uh, that, that helps companies improve the observability of their infrastructure and applications. So it's kind of a wordy way of saying help developers and ops be, be more effective. And we're, we're moving to help more teams and more people in orgs. So we have over 12,000 customers that are using Datadog. We run on millions of hosts, and we ingest, ingest tens of trillions of data points per day. Um, so that is a lot of data to handle um, just in general, let alone reason about from a security perspective and what may be happening from a security perspective. So it's really a meaty problem uh, in general to have just so much going on. And at least for me personally, being an outsider from the security community to just wonder, how you even begin to approach that problem, let alone with something like serverless. A little bit more backstory, um, internally Datadog runs mostly on Kubernetes. Um, and that is certainly not serverless. There are more things to reason about and more things to think about when you deploy to Kubernetes than deploying to hypothetically serverless. Um, in addition to that, Datadog is multi-cloud. So we're not just reasoning about one platform on one cloud, we're reasoning about a platform on multiple clouds. Um, and we also have over 400 integration shipping data. So there is not a homogenous batch of data. There's not a single set or shape of data that gets shipped to Datadog that we have to reason about. And there's not a single shape of data that uh, the security team has to reason about and build stories out of and rationalize about what has been happening within the platform. So the biggest question for me as an outsider um, is like, where do you begin? How do you even detect or react to security events when you just are just pummeled with an onslaught of data in general? And so I found out the answer is even more data, right? <laughs> more, more telemetry in general. Um, and for that, I'll kind of let Will talk a bit about the problem here. Um, Will, you want to tell us a bit about the type of telemetry? It's Kirk. Uh, detecting threats requires data, and that telemetry and those data sets are what fuel our threat detection and incident response efforts here at Datadog. The engineering behind these pipelines needs to ensure that all of the data is delivered to us, that the data is timely, and that the data can be stored in a way that we can reference it again in the future. And uh, in many senses, our job in active defense is to detect the affected. So we need to think like an attacker in order to successfully detect cases where they're attempting to access um, or hack into our environments. Telemetry comes in many different forms. Uh, for example, we collect host-based process execution logs from our production systems, API logs from our public cloud providers, and network logs from our production networks. And these logs can be monitored in different ways, and we frequently refer back to them when investigating security events. To collect security telemetry, we use data pipelines, and our data pipelines are multi-staged. The first stage focuses on the actual ingestion and acquisition of the data. Um, and so that is acquiring the data in a way that can be usable for us. And then in the second stage, we're typically transforming or filtering the data uh, in a way to improve the the usability. So uh, sometimes we are removing data that's not necessary or annotating it with it from another system that makes it more useful. Uh, and then 
Finally, in the third stage, uh, we're going to write that data to a database or an object store or some kind of mess uh, messaging infrastructure that allows us to uh, interact with that data and act on it. And there are many challenges associated with collecting data at this scale. First and foremost, the data volume associated with some data sets uh, necessitates that we use a streaming architecture to process them. Uh, for example, network flow logs can generate terabytes of data per day, and that just makes batch processing really inefficient. And this is one example of where serverless can uh, be really helpful. Uh, Multi-cloud monitoring also pre presents unique challenges. Uh, moving large data sets from one uh, cloud provider to another is not only inefficient, it's also really expensive. And so we need our detection capabilities to operate quickly, soon after the thread is logged, um, in order for us to respond in a timely manner. But they also need to operate where the data is being gathered. So how do we work with these data sets in practice? Uh, here's an example from earlier this year where we had a suspicious command execution involving the Etsy shadow file um, in one of our environments. And when we saw this alert come in, uh, this immediately raised some suspicions because engineers rarely need to interact with this file. And so this was reason enough for us to investigate. And uh, after digging in a bit further, uh, we also identified uh, another command, a curl command, um, that was downloading a file from Google Drive onto the system. And so uh, when we saw this second command execution, it really raised uh, the severity of this investigation and caused us to, to essentially dig in and start to identify what was going on. So the first step in, 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 in an investigation is always identifying the context in which the events occurred. And in this case, that meant identifying uh, first the user account that was associated with these command executions. And once we understand which user account is associated with the activity, we have a better sense of the potential risk associated with what we observed. And so in this case, uh, we can use Datadog to identify uh, the real user account associated with the activity that we observed in this container. Uh, because all of our Kubernetes API logs um, are one of the telemetry sources that we gather, uh, we're really uh, quickly able to drill down to the actual engineer who was performing these actions. So looking at the activity in the container during the time in question, uh, we were able to see that a Golang uh, debugger was installed. And there's nothing overtly malicious about that. We would expect an engineer to use a tool like this during their day-to-day -day operations. So uh, this left kind of more questions about how the shadow file was potentially modified. After looking at the ancestry of the suspicious process launch, uh, we see that they're tied to the APK package manager. And so again, there's nothing wrong with using APK in one of our environments. It's something that we see frequently. Um, and we still don't understand how the shadow file was modified. So um, looking through another one of our telemetry data sources associated with console history, we were able to see that when APK upgrade was executed, uh, that it actually uh, updated a shadow package that in turn uh, ran the commands against the shadow file. And so at this point, we're feeling all right about the, the modifications to the shadow file, uh, but we don't really understand uh, why the curl command was used. When we tried to access uh, the file uh, that was in Google Drive, uh, it wasn't available. And so after reaching out to the engineer, uh, we were able to confirm that they ran the command to bring some additional debugging tools into the container that they were working in. And this is not really ideal, but it's an opportunity to educate. Um, and we wouldn't have ever known about this behavior if we hadn't collected and correlated the various types of signals that we have to bring together to perform this type of investigation. Very cool. Thanks, Bob. Um, so yeah, going through that and kind of thinking, OK, this is one vector of things that Datadog has to deal with. And this is kind of one vector for potential threat actors. Um, wow, there's got to be a lot going on here behind the scenes. And there has got to be a lot more than, you know, as an outsider, I can think of off the top of my head. Um, so the biggest question for me is, is, how does this work? And how do teams operate in this, this area? And Upon reaching out internally, I, I found out that the way that Datadog reasons about this problem is via two separate teams. Um, 
they're, they're separate teams, but they very work very close and hand in hand. So th there is the active defense team, which is responsible for doing the tools, monitors, and signatures, kind of responding to potential threats, and the security platform, which is responsible for kind of data ingestion and preparing it and making sure it's available in the proper format to be able to handle new, new threats and new unknowns. Um, and so with that, I will let David talk a bit about building security platform. Yeah, thank you, Kirk. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the security platform that we host that enables the active defense team to detect threats in real time and a little bit about how serverless fits into that. Uh, but yeah, the security platform, uh, we're responsible for all the detection infrastructure at Datadog. So we run at the intersection of data engineering and backend uh, to do these things uh, in real time and as active defense gets new ideas. Um, we have this data lake that we maintain that contains all of the uh, cloud and server events that we want to process. And then we expose an API to the active defense team to run detections in real time. So depending on what the team finds on there, um, we can then alert a analyst through Slack or through PagerDuty or other common web technologies around uh, that threat. Um, so this system is what we call Poseidon. So this is similar to the SIM tooling you can buy on the market. Um, however, this is built with really common web technology, web and data technology. So we have a lot of ETL concepts in here. Uh, we use Spark, um, but at the end of the day, uh, it, it does pretty similar things to a SIM product. Uh, this Poseidon tool offers um, a way for the active defense team to build codified alerts. So we give them an API for them to write signatures using Go. And then we have a system that processes those signatures and detects uh, those threats in real time based on that, uh, based on that script. Um, and this runs on this service that we call Trident. An example of such a script is maybe something that detects a reverse shell, similar to what Will described earlier. So this might look in um, audit D data for uh, the reverse shell. So all of these data sources that we track um, usually come from external services, from uh, external clouds, um, from data dog logs, um, from endpoints. Uh, so these things, when they come in, um, we usually process them with lambdas. So this is probably the first place in our stack where we touch uh, serverless. So we usually have a internal Lambda built for each of these different integrations. So this might be a API that we have on the internet. It might be a Lambda that hooks into a cloud event. Um, there's a bunch of different patterns that we use, but there, we almost always represent these with a Lambda. Um, Lambdas have just been um, really easy to use and quick to deploy. So it makes sense for these pretty limited and scope applications that we run. So we have these lambdas, actually, can you go back one slide? Thank you. Um, so we have these lambdas that process uh, the um, log data that we intake. We then have one special lambda that then does some additional processing on that data. We call it the DD logs extract lambda. So that organizes the lambdas for us um, according to a really um, a custom directory format in uh, AWS S3. So now I'm going to talk about um, an example uh, detection that we run. Uh, we've been working on some tooling around running detections on network flow logs. So the problem statement is as follows. So given a list of malicious IPs and IP ranges, we want to identify everywhere within Datadog's infrastructure where there is traffic between our internal servers and these malicious IPs. And this gives us, um, uh, this gives us insight into whether 
we're talking to malicious actors, so be it through malware or uh, uh, other other ways. This is an example of a AWS VPC flow log. Um, some of the metadata uh, the log contains is on the screen. So you have the AWS account ID, source and destination IPs, as well as source and destination ports, uh, the start and end time of uh, the specific thing the flow log is capturing. Here it's an uh, accept state. And then here is an example of threat intelligence data. So this is, uh, these are the uh, malicious IPs and malicious ciders that, that uh, we track. Um, up top, you've got an example of an IP, um, as well as some metadata around where we, or why the IP is considered malicious. Um, and then on the bottom, we have an example of uh, a cider or a, a network range. Um, so given those two things I just described, one of the problems we're trying to solve is how to join the two data sources together so that we have uh, insight into where we're talking to uh, these malicious uh, IPs. I imagine there's a lot of traffic to sort through there. There is. All right. Um, thank you, David. Will, you want to talk a bit about how Active Defense works and try to? So, um, Active Defense is Datadog's blue team. And what that means is that uh, we're responsible for uh, threat detection and incident response internally. And so um, Datadog's kind of unique take on a blue team is that we're really focusing on fully automating um, the detection and response capabilities that we have internally. Um, and we use uh, the Poseidon system to, uh, to build and define monitors uh, that al allow us to continually detect um, if there's a potential system compromise or security issue uh, in any of our production workstations um, or production environments. Um, and we also actively hunt for uh, compromises and threats and uh, that threat hunting uh, takes place in all of the data silos um, that are uh, maintained as a part of the work that the platform team does. And uh, like I just uh, mentioned, um, uh, we basically define these small monitors, um, which are self-contained Go programs uh, that contain the logic for detecting um, a security relevant event from our data lake. And uh, these are defined uh, using a cron-like syntax um, that uh, contains information about where the alert should go, uh, what the alert's relative priority is, um, and how the alert should be escalated. So um, not all alerts warrant uh, a human response, but for some of our higher fidelity monitors um, that, that we know uh, indicate um, a real or significant security issue. So for example, if someone is attempting to use a root account to access uh, one of our cloud providers, that's something that we very much want to notify the security team about uh, as soon as possible. So, um, what type of integration, whether it's Slack or PagerDuty, uh, depends on uh, the underlying monitor itself. Um, so we do page in some cases, but in, in most cases, we allow the system to uh, respond and review to uh, any alert that comes in on its own. So in terms of the development workflow, um, it's pretty straightforward and what you would expect um, in uh, environments such as Datadogs. So we can start by developing our monitors locally. Um, we have the ability to reach in and uh, run those local monitors against our staging and production data sets. Um, and then once we're feeling uh, confident um, with the efficacy of the monitor, um, we open a pull request uh, against a internal uh, monitor repository. Um, and then once that pull request lands, um, the deployment takes place automatically through our CI CD system. Great, thanks Will. And one of the things that I think uh, is interesting for me is, is I, I realize they're two different things, but, but the problem set sounds so similar to me of there, there is this job to be run and um, you know, kind of that, um, that Spark query potential or that, that management engine and then executing it in serverless. And, and for me, it almost feels like a precursor to serverless with, all, with this kind of uh, ETL jobs. Um, so, 
with, with that, let, let's talk a bit about why, uh, David, your team chose, chose serverless. And um, let's, let's get a little bit more context because Datadog internally runs Kubernetes. Um, and this is not Kubernetes. Serverless is not Kubernetes. Um, and in, in talking to you, I think the one thing that stuck out the most um, about why you guys moved to serverless is, is the fact that developing for it is pleasant. Um, you want to speak a bit to that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So developing on serverless is really pleasant given you're developing on one of the supported serverless uh, languages. Yeah. So that's JavaScript, Python, Go, a, a couple of other ones. So if that's the case, you pretty much have a end-to-end -end framework in which to deploy your Lambda to production. Um, so we use internally the serverless framework. And yep. I think it's pretty much the leading uh, serverless framework out there. But with that tooling, we can put something on production in, in days or in less than a day. Um, and that, that, that's in large contrast to some of the other systems we have deploying at Datadog. And some of that expense with these other systems comes because um, you're usually deploying things to much larger scale. And we, with the serverless framework, we don't have to take on um, that sort of, uh, those sorts of parameters. Yeah. Um, so for, again, for my, oh, go for it. I was gonna say, it, it seems like less cognitive overhead to think about, right? You have a set of constraints to worry about and, and that is the platform. And having that, that freedom, it seems, um, lets you kind of have the, the next thing that I wanna talk about and, and that is kind of developer velocity, right? The, the ability to deploy confidently and um, not have to worry about the context of where your application is going to live as much. Yeah, yeah, that, that that's exactly correct. So serverless lets us really tune the type of deployment that we want to run. So if, if we're going to do something for that tracks five AWS events a day, we've got we can use the serverless framework. If we are targeting, say, uh, a million events a day, there's other AWS technologies to use there, like Fargate, for example. Cool. Um, and and so I think one of the interesting things about serverless applications. Is, is that they're different, right? I, I, I realize there are open source frameworks for serverless, but I don't know that there are a lot of open source programs written for serverless that I see. Um, and so I think as a paradigm and as a way of working as a team, serverless kind of presents a new paradigm. And I, I think it's interesting how your team has approached um, kind of the mechanics of working together as a team. Um, in particular, I think it's interesting how you guys chose to use a monorepo for all of the security stuff. And um, the, the kind of decision to have two languages you can deploy to. Um, you want to speak a bit about how that has gone and where those decisions came from? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we, we have a monorepo that contains all of our security oriented lambdas. Uh, this just falls from a pattern that's just widely used at Datadog, the monorepo pattern. But uh, even though we, we we took on that choice just because that, that's what we do at Datadog, there's been a lot of advantages uh, in having the monorepo. We have a lot of shared libraries used throughout uh, various security lambdas. There's a lot of shared types, shared functions, and so on. So that, that's been really helpful for us. Um, there, there's a lot of shared behavior and shared responsibilities uh, between all of our lambdas, even though they might do pretty different things. So uh, yeah, that, that's ultimately been a huge convenience to us. Yeah, so one of the things I really like looking through the repo is that there is a, a bash script to generate kind of the, the structure and the bones of the serverless application that you're adding or created. Um, and, and that the creation script is specific for each target language that we support. Um, and I, I think that those kind of toolings around kind of the metadata of deploying an application are important. And you know, the hypothetical sell with serverless is that you don't even need to worry about any of the metadata stuff. But I, I think in practice with having a team, um, having that kind of hygiene is, is great to see. Yeah, like, yeah. So. We, we, we try to not be too opinionated as to how people run uh, their Lambdas, but we do give them some pretty, uh, pretty good tooling around how to build and deploy their lambdas. So we, we keep that constant 
and then we let people innovate everywhere else. Yeah, I, I think that's a good trade-off from my perspective. Um, you, you do want to have some rails in general so that there's a yeah. common language to, to speak to when things go wrong or you have problems. Uh, another thing that I saw is kind of how you approach CI CD. So again, that, that bash script kind of sets up the framework for this kind of stuff too, I believe, right? You can add your CI CD setup here. Exactly, so CI CD is something also we do on Rails here. Uh, we have one common CI CD system uh, configured in a custom, but pretty simple format. Uh, we just assume everyone has a make command in their Lambda that runs their tests. And if that's the case, we, that is what we run uh, on CI. And since everyone's using the serverless, uh, serverless framework, uh, we can deploy their Lambdas in the same style. So using the same command. So all, all of those things fit pretty neatly together because we, we are using some common technologies everywhere. Yeah, and, and so another thing there that's interesting is kind of having that branch-based uh, deployment pattern. I, I'm curious, from, from my perspective, one of the trickier things with Lambda is figuring out how to do staging deploys. And I imagine that being in the security space, some of these deployments you're doing are touching sensitive APIs. Um, how, do you, how do you reason about that and how, how confident are you in doing the, these dev deploys and how much cognitive overhead of, is there of, okay, before I deploy this, what API am, going, am I going to be hitting and what am I gonna be doing with this data? Yeah, it, it's something we probably haven't solved perfectly yet, but we, we are kind of stumbling upon a pretty good um, staging pattern in our Lambdas. So we usually try to um, recreate all of our Lambda infrastructure in staging and production environments and in, in a perfect world, those two environments are completely isolated and we can run two different Lambda environments. A lot of the times that's not the case, but when, when we can succeed in creating two environments, um, it, it, it naturally um, follows the same uh, staging environment principles you see with other applications. So some of the time we, we can arrive on something like that. Sometimes we're prevented from doing that for various reasons. I, I imagine so. I imagine there are a few APIs that are either scary yeah. to hook into or you want to be very sure about what you're doing before you hook into. Exactly. Yeah, sometimes there's a API limits, AWS limits. Maybe you can only watch a certain event in one in one way. So there's no, the no real way to, way to the, yeah. The best way to figure out those limits is in production always. <laughs> and realizing they, they didn't exist. Speaking of which, you have a manual override or two for deploying, right? Is, does that work for both production and dev? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we, we don't cover every single base with what we do uh, with our Lambdas. So occasionally someone will want to, for example, de deploy a dev branch they have on their laptop to the staging environment without going through the CI CD. Um, wow. So we want to enable that workflow. Um, ultimately, we give people a path to do that using the serverless framework. So if, if you have experience using the serverless framework, you can just create a command to uh, do what you want. So deploying your local branch to production or to the staging environment. Yeah. Um, so we give people some pretty loose instructions on how to do that. Uh, the serverless framework is pretty simple. So most people figure out how to do that. Okay, cool. So that, that's something, would that be something you would use if say there was an incident and maybe one of the systems was affected by it? Or is that something that you would use just because, um, you know, yeah, there, there's a lot of different uh, scenarios, um, incidents. Yeah, that, that's a great example. Um, oftentimes, people want to test their local changes on a, on a staging environment without having to go through CICD because maybe um, the feature they're working on is still in development. So oh, they, they, they might not have working tests yet. Gotcha. Um, and the staging environment for us is a place where you can put changes like that on. Um, another thing I saw, which, you know, is hypothetically what all grown-ups do when they create code and create projects. Um, the, the team seems very good at creating very verbose uh, readmes. Um, it, it seemed like every project I saw um, had a great readme to go along with it within each one of the subdirectories. So at, at a very high level, the, the root level directory tells you, 
here's how we do serverless deploys. These are the tools. These are how, this is how you should reason about doing these things. And then with e within each project, I kind of see the same structure of here are all the APIs we touch. Here's the context to know about why we built it. Here's a link for more information about it. Um, and, and I think that that really does a great service as, as an outsider looking at these repos. And it does seem to me that because serverless applications are so small in general, um, there is less of a less of an incentive to to collaborate on them. It, it feels very much like one person can own a serverless program and ship it by themselves. And um, I think that this is very conducive to um, facilitating working together on serverless programs that would otherwise seem too small. Um, how has it gone from your perspective? Do you see a lot of collaboration in, in these repos um, in general? Yeah, yeah. So the, the way we handle serverless projects varies in scope. So we have these small 10 line lambdas that yep. work on an AWS event that, that comes in once or twice a day. Mm -hmm. Then we got major projects composed of thousands of lines with uh, five, six collaborators. So we, we really try to enable both types of workflows. Uh, documentation is really key uh, for both uh, types of lambdas. Um, ultimately, it, it's a team game that we're playing out here. So we, we try to spread the operation load between everyone and the, the documentation helps us there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I will note an interesting thing about lambdas is that the um, type of operations that you do tends to be common to most lambdas. So sometimes you can write these readmes or documentation pages that are uh, almost global in scope. They'll, they'll help you on uh, the majority of your lambdas. Yeah, I, I think that's very cool. And, and I think that kind of the 10 line lambda is in my head, it's like the one that makes the most sense and the one that makes the least sense to collaborate on, but potentially, you know, it's going to happen. Collaboration is inevitable, right? Somebody else is going to have to read that code. Um, but I do like the potential small, small code. One of the other things that we, we brought up about this um, as, as a benefit of serverless in general is kind of the, isol the isolation from product, right? Um, being able to deploy potentially sensitive or um, you know, things that hit a lot of APIs um, independently from the greater Datadog infrastructure. Um, it, it, potentially you're a bad deploy not taking down production for Datadog. Is, is that something that you, you've seen uh, play out. Now that I said it, of course, it's inevitable that's going to happen. <laughs> um, but uh, has that been a real benefit for you in general? It, it, it has been. Um, there, there's a lot of safeguards in place that prevent security infrastructure from affecting production. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, in, in my time at Datadog, I, I'm not completely sure if there's been a major incident involving security infrastructure. Um, I think there, there's been some minor incidents. They they can affect each other in really interesting ways, actually. Yeah. But yeah, we, we have a lot of protections in place um, from the separate AWS accounts, from network isolation. So yeah, there, there's a lot of stability on the production side. Uh, well, maybe not only because of how we do things on security, but it, it, it has added to that. Um, a lot of the ways we work with Datadog production is through uh, cloud providers. So we, we really rely on them um, to really get us the data. So there, there's almost complete isolation between uh, production and our, our AWS accounts. Yeah, from, from my perspective, that, that is a critical point for your team because it seems like your team is touching a lot of domains and you're expected to be able to hop in and out of separate domains. Uh, of you know knowledge of types of information of behaviors of systems of system level architectures and, and it seems like that is a lot to manage and a lot to have to reason about and kind of adding the overhead of oh here's another deployment target and here's another set of constraints for that deployment target seems seems like a bit much to add to an already filled plate so um, yeah yeah it, I, I wouldn't say what we're doing is perfect uh, we we are gaining a lot of uh, security deployment targets, um, but the benefit of not having to 
the, the data doc production stuff there definitely helps. Um, one other thing I saw in the mono repo is uh, within the readme, you, you added kind of telemetry practices. And in particular, there was like a, a way to write metrics, a way to do secure logging in Python. Um, you you want to speak to where that came out of uh, in general? Yeah, yeah. So that that is related to the on, on Rails approach that we have uh, around serverless. So we try to give everyone a a pretty quick path to do all the standard things that we do in our lambdas. So metrics, logs, monitoring, things like that. We all have, we have um, just simple ways to get that running uh, on your lambda. So sometimes it's a package or library for the programming language that you're using. Sometimes it's a Terraform module that appends this behavior to, to your lambda. There's a couple of different approaches, but this is these things are things that every Lambda that we deploy needs, especially being Datadog and having a focus on operations and observability. Um, so yeah, we, we try to make it a, a really quick path to uh, integrating those things. For sure, it's, it's great to see. Um, and then kind of, I think one, one of the more interesting things, especially given the reInvent announcements, um, is the fact that it, it sounds like some of these lambdas are ingesting a lot of data. And with the current behavior model of lambdas, whenever an event occurs, a lambda gets spun up and created to handle a specific event, and then it goes away. Um, and so you're telling me there's a few systems that we're using now um, where that model of spinning up a serverless instance for, for each event probably won't continue to scale. Um, you want to speak a bit to about that? Um, yeah. So we are entering the territory in a few of our different projects where uh, we where the economics of lambdas really do not make sense. Um, I think you'll, you'll have to calculate it according to your workload, but it, it's, it's actually fairly easy to run into those scenarios. Um, so there, there's a lot of new serverless technology out there that lets you overcome some of those barriers. Uh, the one we've been scoping out is Fargate. So Fargate is, in a way, is kind of a serverless Kubernetes, if you will. So it's a way to run uh, containers without having to operate the underlying servers. So uh, AWS gives you a really quick path to deploying a container with Fargate, similar in scope to a Lambda, actually. So all the advantages that come from Lambdas also apply to Fargate. <laughs> Um, so we've been scoping that out for a few different projects, projects that handle large numbers of events, as well as ways to run uh, distributions of software. Um, so some, some things are not easily deployed as Lambdas, especially yeah. if they're, they're not APIs. Let's say there's some software distribution we want to grab, um, some open source project and we want to run it. Fargate gives us an really easy path to get that up and running versus having to go through Kubernetes or using other configuration management tooling to operate servers. Gotcha. And, and so it sounds like to an extent serverless scales at, at which point you're, you're starting to reevaluate and say, okay, do we, do we move to containers and concurrency? Um, yeah, we've been lucky in that it now seems like AWS offers a serverless solution for any type of scale. So you can really fit uh, any workload that you're trying to run on AWS's serverless implementation. Awesome. All right, with that, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, attendees, for uh, coming. I'm going to switch it over to questions. And it seems we've got a couple already in here. Um, are all the security lambdas deployed in the same AWS account? Um, and, and I think that that one, uh, Datadog is multi-cloud, but I will let you kind of continue to answer that one, David. The answer to that is uh, no. So we have multiple security AWS accounts. So we usually target one of those. I, I would say that our lambdas tend to only target security AWS accounts. I, I'm not sure if there's an example of a Lambda we put on production or Datadog staging, for example. Okay, cool. Um, 
I'm curious about the collaboration between the security platform and active defense teams. Are there any sort of storming exercises or frameworks you regularly uh, facilitate to uncover needs and observability? And how do you continually fi figure out signal gaps or redundancies? And I, I think I partially know the answer to the question, but I will let, I will let Will take this one. Sure. So um, we approach uh, this problem from a few different directions. So uh, first, the security platform team and the active defense team work together to ensure that we continue to ha have the visibility that we need. So um, one example um, of that would be auditing our environments to ensure that all of our production systems um, are reporting telemetry uh, back to the security platform. Um, and then in terms of uh, the detections that we have and our detection coverage, um, there's a few different ways that we, that we test and validate that. So uh, we write integration tests for um, all of the detectors that we write. So we actually um, have uh, tests run as a part of our CICD system uh, to ensure that uh, the data that we provide in the test will actually trigger the monitor in the way uh, that we think it should. Um, and then so use uh, Atomic Red Team internally uh, to run different types of attacks in our environments to ensure that uh, the end-to-end -end data pipeline and alerting system is actually uh, producing the results that we expect. Um, we also work internally with our offensive security team in a informal manner um, to perform internal tests and assessments of our various systems. And so there's a lot of different ways that we um, approach that problem. Um, and they're almost uh, all kind of cross-functional um, within the security engineering organization. Yes, it, it also saw, sounds like that job is never done. It sounds like there is always going to be something you're missing and there's always going to be that kind of paranoia, which seems like an underlying current in security in general. <laughs> All right, uh, another question. I may have missed this, but how much of your Datadog configuration do you do via infrastructure as a code, i.e. dashboards, monitors, et cetera? So I, I think, David, that one will probably go to you. Sure. Uh, I'd say 80% of our Datadog configuration is done in Terraform. So things like monitors, um, mainly monitors. Uh, everything else tends to be done manually, things like dashboards. Um, we use this really cool open source Chrome extension that allows you to design your monitor with the Datadog GUI, um, exporting the Terraform configuration for the monitor. So that's what we then um, save it to Terraform. Um, but yeah, they, I, I'm not sure we have a great approach yet for dashboards. From what I remember, there's still a good amount of toil in building a dashboard through pure Terraform. So right, right now the, uh, the, the UI is definitely more useful. Um, as, as a follow-up, uh, Frederick just asked what the name of the extension is. Um, yeah, one second. It's called Datadoc to Terraform Converter. Datadoc to Terraform Converter. It sounds appropriate. Um, Andrew, I will actually ask your opinion here um, when, it, when it comes to dashboards in general and how to think about building them. It seems to me like you, you want to at least do partial uh, uh, some amount of your dashboards manually. You want to kind of do that design process ahead of time. Do you have any opinions on what makes for an effective dashboard? So I think what really makes for an effective dashboard is being able to quickly and readily answer the question of, is, is this thing working the way that I intend it to be working? And when we talk about security, we really talk about are, are, there any, are there any active alerts that need eyes on glass, right? So we want to go straight from security signal to a very strong active alarm, right? That's, that's telling an analyst in a very short amount of time they need to start diving in and doing an investigation. But as far as the life cycle goes, I think it's great to build these things by hand. And I don't think we should be afraid to build them by hand before we move them into infrastructure as code or as it's referred to often in the chat, IAC, uh, you know, because really you have to prove it out kind of first. And then you can always export JSON, of course, from, from Datadog and then put it in a CI CD pipeline. Yeah, I, I think a lot of that resonates with me. I, I think um, you, you kind of want to be deliberate and you want to be a bit creative and you want to kind of 
get everything up there first and then say, okay, what can I get rid of? What, what is essential here? And, and I think it's a, a bit of discovery of what the problem is and, and what the context you need for the specific problem is. Yep. Okay. Above, uh, above, the, above the fold on that page is always those high level alarms, right? And below the fold, I always think about whatever can go to reducing time to triage, right? So how many helpful links can I put in that dashboard to help somebody fa be faster and more effective? So is that taking them to the security signal? Is it taking them to the logs time range, et cetera? Gotcha, perfect. All right, another question. I know it's not directly, but it's directly related, but if there is time, one of the many dimensions of data security in monitoring tool is ensuring the right users have access to the right data and not more. So, do you have granular RBAC coming? Uh, does, does anybody know if we can speak to this? Crickets? I, I can speak towards what we do with our internal data um, as to granular RBAC in the Datadoc product. I, I, I'm not quite sure. Um, we, we do have pretty granular RBAC uh, around how we maintain data in our data lake. We have um, several AWS roles um, for different types of, for the different types of people that work with the data. And uh, there, there's pretty clear R back around who has access to what. And that extends to both object, object data in S3, as well as uh, R back for all of the databases that we load with the security data. And yeah, for, for any of the greater information, I don't know that we can be talking about Datadog uh, timelines uh, in this public venue, unfortunately. Um, but yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, I see no more questions. I will give a few seconds, but in those few seconds for any question to come in, thank you so much, David, uh, Will, and Andrew, for joining me and sharing all this great context about what's been going on and how we've been using serverless and how we've been approaching security. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, and it appears no questions came in through those first few seconds. So thanks everybody, enjoy the rest of your day and have a great one, bye. Thanks everyone.